Okay, so a couple of announcements. Um, tonight is the first presidential debate. If you watch most or all of the debate and you write something up for me, like a couple of paragraphs about what they talked about, what you thought, etc., you can get two points extra credit. And I will offer this for all three of the debates. So if you watch most or all of the debate tonight, write something up and email it to me, you'll earn two points extra credit. Um, and the same for the other two debates as well. Um, partly so you guys will watch the debate and also because I like to offer extra credit, but there's nothing really on campus we can do right now. So um, watching the debate will be um, current, relevant, and an opportunity for extra credit. Also, on Thursday, I will be posting the midterm exam in Blackboard. It is an open book short essay exam, and you'll have one week to complete it. Um, any questions on that? No? Okay. Great. So today we're going to talk about the big bad media. Um, we're going to talk about the different types of media, um, some of the issues with the switch to online media, um, and issues we have with the media. All right, so to begin with, freedom of the press is a First Amendment protection. It's what gives newspapers, magazines, and websites the right to publish information, um, to criticize government action or inaction, to let us know what our leaders are saying. Uh, so freedom of the press is a very fundamental First Amendment protection. And the media is necessary to help inform the public on what's going on. Provide a forum for debates um, between different parties, different ideologies, different beliefs. And to keep an eye on what our leaders are doing. So we don't have to love the media, but it is necessary to keep us up to date on what's happening. What's the latest in the presidential election polls? What's happening with COVID-19? What about the fight that's going to be gearing up in the Supreme Court? So it's a way of helping us to understand what's going on in this country. Who's saying what, who's doing what, et cetera. And the media, when it serves its role of watchdog properly, can help us to prevent corruption with leaders. The front of the House of Representatives spent 200,000 of our tax dollars on office furniture. We need to know about that. Um, when President Nixon broke the law during Watergate, we needed to know about that. We need to know what our politicians and our leaders are doing. And I'm sure some of you saw um, that information about President Trump's tax returns was released, um, showing that he only paid $750 some years in taxes, none in others. Um, but the real bombshell, I think, was the realization that he's not quite as wealthy as he says he is, that he owes something like $300 million. And on the one hand, probably not going to change people's minds necessarily about how they vote. On the other hand, the president is the leader of the country, so we should know how he is behaving, um, if he's playing by the rules.
Okay, so there's a couple of different types of media. And what we consider traditional media includes print media. So newspapers like the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times. Magazines like Rolling Stone, um, Time Magazine, and others. Also, of course, broadcast media, radio, television. The traditional media is really being replaced by digital media. Nowadays, we largely read our news online. Three out of every four internet users get their news online. We're not subscribing to newspapers or magazines anymore. Um, we're going to foxnews.com or cnn.com and we're looking at the news. The traditional media still exists, but it's not quite the force it used to be. Out of curiosity, anyone still subscribe to a newspaper? Magazine? No? Nope. All online? Yeah. I subscribe to one print magazine, Foreign Policy. That's because I'm a politics geek and I like what, to know what's going on. So, also, I like holding a newspaper in my hand or a, a, or a magazine. But. Okay, so print media is still important in some ways. If you are part of the political elite, if you work in government, if you work in Washington, D.C., you're still going to buy newspapers. You get a lot more detailed coverage in a newspaper. Online, there's only so much space, right? There's a short blurb and then an ad or the next article. Um, so for people who are heavily involved in the political system, they're still going to subscribe to the New York Times or the Washington Post, etc. But because the news has moved online, we are seeing less journalists in the field. There were about 60,000 in 2005. There's only about 39,000 today. You don't need as many journalists for an online news site. Um, you don't need as many field reporters if you move to more digital content. So what we've seen happening is newspapers are starting to create digital subscriptions. And what they call metered content. Basically, what the New York Times does is it says you can have up to four free articles a month. After that, you either have to get a subscription or pay for an article. So if you're someone who reads the New York Times every day, you're going to buy a digital subscription. And they ended up with almost 2 million subscribers by 2016. So a lot of newspapers have switched to the metered model. You get maybe 
four free articles, and then after that, you have to start paying. Um, they need to make money, so they start asking people to pay for coverage. But the problem with the decrease in journalists is that we're not seeing as comprehensive campaign coverage as we used to. There was some discussion about Trump University, but there wasn't enough real scrutiny of President Trump's business issues um, or some of Hillary Clinton's work at the State Department, right? We didn't know as much about the candidates as we used to. Um, and there's information that probably should have come out sooner than it did, right? The infamous Trump grabbed them by the you know what tape. If it had come out during the primaries, would that have made a difference? Who knows? All right, for broadcast media, what we see is the rise of headline news. You go to Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, and you hear this 30, 60 second clip. Joe Biden was speaking in Pennsylvania today. Next up, keeping up with the Kardashians is coming to an end, right? You get this brief little sound bite, and then it's on to the next story. There's no real in-depth coverage. And a lot of it, even though it's a 24-hour news channel, it's recycled content. They're just repeating the day's news over and over again, um, repackaging the content. So what we get is a brief glimpse, but not the full story. They'll play a brief clip from a debate or a campaign stop but not the full context. In 2016, Marco Rubio made the same statement criticizing President Obama four times in one debate. And the media ran with it and started calling him Robot Rubio, which, while funny, doesn't exactly tell the voters why he kept saying it. Like, what point was he trying to make? Where was he going with this? So there's a lot of surface level coverage. Um, the only time they ever really seem to go into depth is when it's something major like a natural disaster or a shooting or something like that. And even then it's a lot of recycled material, repeating of things. There's also radio shows, Rush Limbaugh, um, NPR. NPR is fairly popular because they're pretty neutral in their content. Um, also things like podcasts. NPR started doing podcasts on things like um, trials and things like that and started seeing more downloads. There's also comedy shows with political content like The Daily Show where they talk about the news in a humorous way to kind of reach out to people who maybe wouldn't pay attention otherwise. Um, mocking politicians for saying stupid things, etc. right? But in broadcast and print media, minorities are underrepresented. They only make up 22% of local TV news sources and 18% of print media. So we're still not seeing enough minority representation in mass media. Um, it's getting better in some ways, but if you look at the news anchors of the major stations in the 60s and throughout most of the 70s, it was mostly white men. Um, so with changing, it's just taken a little bit of time to see more minority representation um, as news um, presenters and not necessarily being talked about. Where 
of the biggest problems we can see with media is unfortunately most of the media is controlled by major conglomerates, Disney, people like Rupert Murdoch, who owns Fox News and a whole bunch of newspapers and tabloids globally. And more than three-fourths of newspapers are owned by a large corporation, like Disney, Sinclair, and others. We also find that over 500 TV stations are affiliated with the four major networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox. What this means is that there's not a lot of differentiation or variety in the news. Other than the local, local news, you could be watching the same broadcast in McAllen that you're watching in Springfield, Illinois, and the content's going to be very similar because they're owned by the same company. You get a lot of the same content other than the very local news. So Disney owns ABC, ABC Family, um, they just launched Disney Plus, their streaming service. Um, you have companies like Sinclair, uh, Time Warner, Bloomberg News controlled by conglomerates, very, very wealthy individuals. And this is because of the 1996 Telecommunications Act. Congress essentially opened the door for larger media companies to buy smaller ones, allowed for the consolidation and reduced competition. And so it's gotten to the point where there's just not a lot of variety, where we're not going to see a variety of viewpoints and opinions and so on. So if I remember correctly, I think Disney bought Hulu as well, so they're buying even more media, including digital content. Okay, so for the most part, people today go online for their notes. 78% of people under the age of 50 get their news from social media. Facebook, um, Twitter, Instagram, and so on. And it makes sense, right? You're on the go, you're working, you're taking classes, you can just pull out your phone and say, hey, what's happening around the world? We're also seeing the rise of what's called a digital citizen. We're using the internet for our news, but we're also sometimes part of the news. If you go to a protest and it turns violent and you film it, the local media stations will probably try to buy your footage from you. Um, if you film a shooting or you're interviewed about a shooting, you're part of the news making process. So we do see people becoming part of the news making process, um, sharing footage, talking about um, what happened after a schooling. They want to talk to teachers, parents, students, etc. We've also seen a rise in niche journalism. Websites will try to target their news towards a particular demographic. Huffington Post is very liberal, so they're targeting um, people who would consider themselves on the left end of the spectrum. Buzzfeed tries to target young people. Um, 
And they've been pretty successful at it. They've created content like BuzzFeed Unsolved videos, which are hilarious. Um, but they're also presenting news. And they were actually given a ton of documents about illegal banking practices globally that showed that banks in the United States and elsewhere were not doing enough to end money laundering um, and transfers of money by cartels, terrorist groups, etc. So they've actually become a bit of a player in the news market. There's also a core social media. There's a little over 2.2 billion Facebook users around the world, and about 214 million Americans are on Facebook. And this, of course, can be both good and bad. Um, you can use Facebook to post content that fits your personal worldview. Um, you can post, you know, information or look at the news through your lens. So if you're liberal, you're probably not going to look at Fox News. If you're conservative, you're not going to be looking at CNN. Um, so you're going to filter out the news that you see is too liberal or too conservative. All right, any questions or comments so far? Any questions online? Okay, okay. so study plan journalism is both good and bad. Um, it can be helpful to have news reporting, commentary by the people. If you want to know how people in the Rio Grande Valley feel about the Senate race, you're going to want to talk to the people. Um, interview people on the streets, ask people to um, take part in a discussion, things like that. And again, the use of eyewitnesses. Um, after the shooting in Parkland, they were talking to law enforcement, parents, uh, teachers. What happened? What did you see? And my least favorite question, how do you feel? Really, they just went through something traumatic. That's not a question you should be asking. But it's a way to kind of help people understand what happened, um, why something may have occurred. Um, it's also how they're able to find out that the school resource officer at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School did not go in and engage the shooter like he was supposed to. Right? You got to find out that kind of information. So citizen bloggers can be useful. They can help break a story sooner. Um, if, God forbid, like a water main exploded, on Pipe Street here, then someone local could cover it and then the media would pick up on it. They can also say to the media, hey, you misidentified this person or you got this fact wrong. So they can be a way of keeping journalists in check. But the problem with this, we are not trained journalists. Right, we have not gone through that training. So people will sometimes post inaccurate information. You want to be the person who breaks the story. You want to get all the credit. So this can backfire. 
in very, very awful ways. An example of this is the 2013 Boston Marathon bombing. Every year in April, there is the Boston Marathon. Um, the city basically shuts down. Everybody has to lay off of school and work. People tear along the route. And so two bombers set off um, homemade bombs at the finish line, killing four people and injuring dozens of others. Uh, some people had to have limbs amputated. It was brutal. So law enforcement said, hey, we've got photos of these guys. Can you help us identify them? So a group of people using, I think it was like Reddit and a couple of others, went online and they said, one of these bombers is Sunil Tripathi. Sunil Tripathi was a student who had gone missing in March. And the family had actually set up a Facebook page um, asking for information. And so the family quickly started getting death threats, hate mail, um, terrible phone calls. And law enforcement had to come out and say, she's not one of the suspects. And it turned out the suspects were two brothers. One was later killed in a shootout with the cops, and the other one's in jail. And it turned out that Sunil Kapathi had committed suicide shortly after um, he left home. So he wasn't even alive when this happened. So the family was getting death threats and all sorts of things based on false information. And another example is in January 2011, Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords was shot in the head at a campaign event in Arizona. She was rushed to the hospital and a couple of media outlets uh, jumped the gun and said that she was dead. And so her family was on the plane heading out there hearing that she had died. So they get to the hospital thinking they're going to the morgue and it turned out she was still alive. Um, you don't want things like that happening, right? You don't want that kind of false information getting out. Also, as a rule, um, the media is not supposed to announce the name of the victim until after the family has been notified. And this is actually the result of a plane crash in 1959 that killed three musicians, Buddy Holly, Ricky Valance, and, an, and a, sorry, a musician known as the Big Bopper. Buddy Holly's wife found out that he had died through TV. And she was in such a state of shock that she actually had a miscarriage. Um, so they don't want that happening, right? They don't want the family finding out through television that their loved one died. That's why they usually have to say, um, pending family notification, we can't release the name of this person. OK, so what are some of the benefits of getting news online? Convenient, right? All you have to do is open your phone, take a look, see what's going on. It's also a lot easier to get breaking news. I have both BBC and AP news on my phone. Uh, when something big happens, I get a breaking news flash on my phone. Um, things like natural disasters, shootings, things like that were notified pretty quickly. When we finally killed Osama bin Laden in May of 2011, people knew before President Obama announced it. It was all over the media. Um, we usually know what's happening pretty, pretty quickly. There's more in-depth coverage as well. Um, with newspapers, it's mostly text. Online, you can get photos, video, um, more detailed analysis. If a major earthquake hits, we can see video and photos of the damage. If there's a shooting at a protest, we can see um, images and video, things like that. So we're getting more in-depth coverage in some ways, more of the bigger picture. And it's also good because now we can get our news from all around the globe. Um, the BBC is one of the best news sources internationally. Um, they cover news all over the world, and they offer it in a variety of languages. 
You can learn what's happening in the Middle East about Jazeera. You can read Chinese newspapers that publish in English, right? We know what's happening around the world. When the COVID outbreak started, we were hearing all sorts of news out of China and then more news and more news and more news. So we're able to keep informed about what's happening, know if something terrible happens, and find out what's going on in other countries, what's happening globally. This can be a good thing. We no longer have to wait for the CBS evening news to find out what's happening. But of course, there's also drawbacks to online news. Part of the problem is journalists have to make money to keep covering the news. So you don't see as much investigative journalism. We see more sponsored content. Uh, take this quiz to find out what type of alcohol you are sponsored by Smirnoff, right? We're not getting that in-depth coverage that we used to. Um, it's harder to cover a speech, an event, a candidate. It's harder to get that information we should have prior to an election. There's also problems, of course, with the quality of the news. Um, factual errors, rumors, hate speech. The persistent rumor that President Obama was not born in the US. Um, even though he produced this long form birth certificate. Heat speech, big, big problem on Facebook. Um, Facebook knows that they're not doing enough to counteract hate speech and false information. So they're trying to institute fact checking, but it's not going to be fully rolled out before the election. So there's still going to be a lot of false information circulating. Um, Issues with things like the um, attacker in New Zealand who live streamed his attack on the mosque, um, or the 17 year old kid um, who went to Wisconsin um, because he's part of a right wing Facebook group that said we should organize and go out and shoot protesters. Obviously, that's a problem, right? And Facebook knows they need to fix it, they just haven't quite figured out how they're going to fix it. Um, also, we can pick and choose which media we look at. You can say Fox News is right-wing garbage or CNN is liberal propaganda. I'm not looking at those websites. Um, I'm only going to look at Huffington Post or Breitbart or Occupy Democrats. Um, so instead of looking at the news as it is, we've started filtering it into what we think is actually happening. We're not necessarily getting the big picture anymore. And of course, there's also, unfortunately, the ability for terrorist groups and hate groups to very easily spread um, propaganda and violent messages. ISIS has unfortunately been very good at using social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, um, posting photos of beheadings, uh, taking video of the Jordanian pilot that they burned alive, um, posting things like 
uh, recruitment for members to come and join Islamic State. Um, it's a lot easier for groups to recruit now. Right? It's a lot easier to reach people living 5,000 miles away. Which is why when I see a friend or relative post something on Facebook, I fact check it and I'm like, hmm, is that really accurate? Maybe, maybe not, right? Um, there's a lot of weird stuff out there and a lot of it's not very accurate. Now, good or bad, the media does have an influence on us. And the media can be a very powerful force. It was because of television and newspapers showing the civil rights protesters being met with um, beatings, water cannons, uh, attack dogs, that people in the North began sympathizing with the protesters, saying, you know what, this isn't right. Um, pushing for the federal government to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So the media was helpful because people in the North finally understood what was happening in the South and said, we have to do something about this. And it was two journalists at the Washington Post, Woodward and Bernstein, who got that confidential source who broke open the Watergate scandal. Um, without that source and without the journalist, Nixon would have served out his second term. And we never would have known about the corruption, um, the bribery, the crimes that were being committed. It's because of journalists that Nixon had to resign office that we found out about all the laws he was breaking. They can hold leaders accountable. Um, if a member of the House of Representatives spends $300, $300,000 of our money on office furniture, we hope the media would report on that, right? We need to know when there's corruption, inefficiency, etc. Unfortunately, sometimes leaders can manipulate the media to promote their own agenda. And we saw this a bit in the Iraq war, or the lead up to the Iraq war. American media was publishing information that said, um, Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. International media was saying um, the inspectors have found the weapons of mass destruction. There's no grounds to go to war. But if you only looked at the American news sources, um, you would have a higher level of support compared to people who looked at international news. And then it came out, of course, that we were misled a bit about Iraq. Um, so sometimes politicians can use the media for their own personal agenda. And there's also the criticism that the media is biased one way or another, that the media is too liberal. No, it's too conservative. No, it doesn't like us. And the criticism of fake news. Now that's a term we've heard quite a bit in the first four years with the Trump administration. And yeah, there is a lot of false information out there. There's a lot of inaccurate information. But if the New York Times or the Washington Post write something, it's pretty much guaranteed to be accurate. They're not gonna post something that's completely false. Um, so President Trump called the article about his tax information fake news, but there's plenty of documents to back it up. So. You can call it fake news, but that doesn't necessarily make it fake news. 
Um, there's a difference between stories you don't like and stories that aren't true. Um, but there are a lot of false stories out there on both sides. Part of the problem with media is also how they frame or discuss an issue. Sometimes they're not very good about covering issues that should be discussed. There were tax cuts by the George W. Bush administration in 2001 and 2003. Tax cuts tend to have two effects. One, widening the um, income gap and two, causing the national deficit to go higher. But the media didn't really talk about that, um, despite the fact that that was part of the reason the economy collapsed in 2008. We also weren't looking at the housing market crisis closely enough prior to its collapse. So sometimes they're just not covering the issues um, that they should be. There's also, of course, selection bias. Um, don't focus on one aspect, one part of the issue. They're not going to show the entire picture. Maybe they'll play a controversial 30 second clip from a Biden speech or a Trump speech without providing the context. Why did they do that? What was this part of? There's also issues of how the media frames a particular event or issue. For example, the health care plan passed under the Obama administration was called the Affordable Care Act by um, more liberal media and referred to as Obamacare by more conservative media. Um, and you still get people who think they're different um, policies, but they're not, right? Um, the left wing media was saying this is really good. Uh, the more right-wing media was saying this is really bad, so it just kind of depended on which way you looked at it. And the other problem is where they engage in priming, where they prepare us to look at an issue or a politician in one way. So if all you're hearing from the media is taxes are too high, we have to cut taxes, what are you going to think? Oh, tax cuts are necessary. Or telling people this candidate's inevitably going to be the nominee. Um, we did that in 2016 with Hillary Clinton. The media kept talking about it was her turn, it was her turn, it was her turn. They weren't talking about what did she think about health care or education. They just kept saying it's her turn. There were two other candidates running against her, Bernie Sanders and Martin O'Malley. Martin O'Malley, his campaign never really got anywhere because the media ignored him. He was on the debate stage and he could ask maybe two questions all night. So he never had a chance to present his views to the American people. And he had some really interesting things to say about education, but he never got the chance to say them. And then the media was largely ignoring Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump until they became too big of a threat to ignore. Um, they kept saying Hillary Clinton's the nominee as early as February of 2016, and I kept wanting to yell at them, she hasn't gotten it yet, right? You can't say she's the nominee. Uh, so when they do that, it's problematic as well because if people don't vote the way they want to, then they vote the way they think they're supposed to. Um, and that's really problematic. Also, when they talk about things like Hillary Clinton's pantsuits, like that has what relevance to policy, right? What does Donald Trump's hair have anything to do with how he's on the White House? Nothing. It, it's not relevant.
Okay, let me clear screen. Okay, um, so to kind of kick off our discussion, we've heard, of course, that the media is hostile to each other, right? We've seen the pundits arguing with each other on television, screaming matches, and so on. But this isn't a new phenomenon. It's been going on since the invention of radio and television. So I'm going to play a clip for you guys from 1968, where we have two political commentators, um, William Buckley and all. Um, William Buckley was a well-known conservative commentator. Gore Vidal was a well-known liberal playwright. And the two men um, basically hated each other's best. And so they got hired by ABC to discuss the Republican National Convention and the Democratic National Convention. It was pretty contentious during the Republican Convention, but it got even worse during the Democratic Convention. And so this is where matters came to a head and it got very, very, very ugly between the two men. Okay, so in case you didn't quite catch what was happening there, um, Gore Vidal called William Buckley a Nazi, which of course anyone would be offended by. And Buckley responded by saying two things you can't say on television in 1968. First, he called him a queer, which you couldn't say. Um, now, Gore Vidal was gay, but you didn't discuss it on television in 1968. And then he said, I'm going to sock you in the goddamn mouth, which you also can't say on television in 1968. Um, after that exchange, um, Buckley never really forgave himself for losing it like that, for um, taking the low road, so to speak. Um, and the two men ended up hating each other for the rest of their lives. William Buckley died first, and then Gore Vidal wrote an article, and at the end he put, rest in peace in hell, William Buckley. Um, so if anyone tries to tell you that hatred between the media is new, uh-uh. No, it's been there since the beginning. Um, and there's a really good documentary on the two men and their relationship called The Best of Enemies. Um, so just keep in mind there's always been contentiousness within the media no matter what. Okay. Um, so, quick show of hands and seeing those of you online. How many of you um, read, watch, or look at CNN um, sometimes on a regular basis? No? Uh, Fox News? Sorry, uh, the question online what news sources do you look at? Do you look at Fox News? Sometimes. Okay. Um, anyone for uh, MSNBC? Okay. Uh, the BBC? Sometimes. Okay. Um, NPR? Not really. Okay. That's that's fair. 
Um, do you look at local news at all? A little bit? No? Okay. Okay. Um, so people do, of course, sometimes have their, their personal favorite news sources or whatever. Um, but if you're looking for really good neutral news content, I recommend the BBC and the Associated Press. Um, the great thing about the BBC is they're not based in the United States. Um, so they tend to approach talking about the U.S. from a non-partisan, here's the information you need to know approach. Um, so they're pretty neutral, um, pretty reliable, pretty impartial. Um, so if you want your news about the, the spin, um, BBC, in my opinion, is, is one of the best. Um, you can get good accurate information um, about U.S., but also if you want to know what's happening around the world. Um, so the BBC is my go-to because if something's posted on there, it's pretty much guaranteed to be accurate. It's extremely rare for them to have to issue a retraction or an apology. Um, they're pretty reliable that way. All right, so do you guys trust the media? Do you trust our media to get it right? A little bit, not really. Okay. Not really. Why not? I mean, there's no right wrong answer. I'm just curious. Why, why not? Okay, they trust it for their own benefit, sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to find. Yeah. It's hard to find that neutral middle ground. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find yourself fact checking things you see posted online? A little bit? There's a really good website, and I'll type it into the chat here. Um, Snopes.com um, fact checks posts on social media. Like one I saw the other day, and this one made me laugh. A friend of mine posted something saying Facebook is no longer going to allow religious posts, so I'm posting the Lord's Prayer here. And I was just like, oh, come on. And so sometimes I'll write back and I'll be like, that's false. <laughs> that is not accurate information. Um, and sometimes you're like, oh, okay. And sometimes you're like, well, I still believe it. And so, okay. Um, yeah, the only time I outright trust a news story when I see it is if I see it on the BBC. If I see it on like Fox News or CNN, I'm going somewhere else to check and see if it's actually real or not um, and what actually happened. Um, yeah, it's kind of kind of hard to feel like you can trust our, our media. Um, tonight's debate is going to be on the major news networks. If you want to watch the debate without the headache of the talking heads, um, PBS is pretty good. They're they're pretty neutral in their commentary. Um, so if you want to watch the debate without the usual spin, um, I recommend watching it on PBS just because they're a bit more neutral, a bit more, they won't be all like, Joe oh, Biden won or Donald Trump said, they're going to be a little bit more impartial. Um, so if you do watch the debate tonight, PBS may be one of the best ways to go so you don't hear them yapping, you know, driving us all nuts. Okay, any thoughts, comments, questions? Okay, so as a reminder, um, for you guys and you online, if you watch tonight's debate and you write something up and email it to me, uh, you can get two points extra credit. This will apply for all three of the debates for up to six points extra credit. And Thursday afternoon, I will post the midterm exam in Blackboard. It's an open book, open note exam. Um, you'll have a week to complete it and then you'll turn it back in through Blackboard. Okay, any questions on that? Nope, everyone's good? Okay, uh, that's the end of class today. We're going to start talking about political, oh, uh, for the extra credit, Eileen, no, not, are you talking about the extra credit or the exam?
the uh, exam or the extra credit, uh, not more than two paragraphs or so. Yeah, uh, an extra credit, uh, one or two paragraphs, yeah. Okay, so we're going to start talking about political participation on Thursday. Uh, so read the first half of Chapter 8, so for you guys online. And if you have any questions between um, now and next week, you can email me, uh, call or text me, um, or pop by my office for a minute. Uh, and if you came in,